All right, so um, welcome to the fourth and, well, final for me anyway, uh, lecture of the summer school on category theory. Although, don't be sad because there's two speakers coming up that will tell you other category theoretic stuff, and in fact, probably much more interesting stuff than I'm talking about because it's related to basically active research, whereas you know this is a background course. So um, I hope that uh, so far it's been mostly comprehensible. Uh, that it will help prepare you for what's next. So I still owe you from last time exponentials. We didn't have time to finish that. And then uh, the main topic for today is what I call the two-dimensional or higher dimensional structure of categories. And so that starts with natural transformations. And then probably the most interesting, at least in my subjective opinion, aspect of that is the construction of adjunctions. So We'll see how much time we have left, but I'll tell you as much about those as, as we can fit in. So um, the last universal construction I want to tell you about is the exponential. And uh, uh, I've been doing these, uh, these in like a very uh, sort of parallel style, so hopefully you sort of see how they're all connected to each other or how they're all similar in construction. So along those lines, um, an exponential of objects <clears throat> A and B in some category is a distinct, oops, I'm not supposed to write distinguish, just say it, but some distinguished object, uh, I'll call E, and arrow, which I'll call epsilon, from E cross A to B, where by cross I mean the product, of course, but when I speak, cross is faster to say, so I'll just say that. Uh, so that for any probe object, X and arrow, F from X cross A to B uh, there is a unique mediating arrow which I'll call lambda of F cleverly from the probe object to the distinguished one such that Uh, if you take the mediating arrow and take its product with the identity arrow on A uh, and compose, compose that with the distinguished arrow, you get the probe arrow. Okay, I might have said that wrong, so let me draw the picture. So here is our... Distinguished arrow, right there. Okay, uh, should lift more space. Okay, here is our distinguished object. Here is our probe arrow. Here is our probe object. And what we're saying is that there's a unique map from the probe object to the distinguished one such that, well, here, right, on the left side of the product is exactly this situation. But we have the product with A, right, here, but we can just take, remember the product is a functor, we saw that last time. So we can take the product with the identity arrow on A, but I will just use this notation, which I introduced in the first lecture, I think, as what I call dimensional promotion. Did I say that? If I didn't, then I should have. And so the idea is whenever you have some place, for example, uh, in a product, right? a product is a functor. So it can either act on two objects or on two arrows. And uh, if I write something like this, 
in which I have an arrow here and what looks like an object there, I promote the object to the identity arrow on that object. It's just a notational shorthand. This is just, you know, this is just the identity arrow on A. Okay, I'll, I'll use this like fairly heavily and it's, it's common in, in use, so you should get used to it. Okay, so, uh, right, so the point is that for every this, there's a unique this such that the triangle commutes. Does it make sense? Okay, so, well, let me orient you a bit. Um, so, the epsilon is called evaluation map. This uh, mediating arrow is called the exponential transpose, but don't make me write that, so I'm going to call it the curry of F. And then this distinguished object E, we usually write as, well, I'll write it like this, with this infix notation. It's also written like this, although I find this very confusing. Okay, so this is the sense in which it's exponential. Uh, so I like the infix uh, notation, but take your pick. Okay, so you should think of this as like, as this, right? So this is just like the function space in functional programming, right? This is like, uh, like the way we make higher order functions. So let me uh, try to convince you of that as we go. But first, since we have now a new universal construction, we can do with it what we've gotten used to doing with all our universal constructions, right? So first, we ask what happens if we choose the probe thing to just be the distinguished oh. thing, right? So if I have my evaluation map, and now for my uh, probe object, I just choose E again. And now I need a probe arrow, but I can just choose epsilon again, right? Then this is saying that I, there's a unique map from E to E, which is the curry of the evaluation map, such that when I cross it with the identity on A, and compose it with the evaluation map, I just get the evaluation map. Now, can you think of an arrow that I can put here that has that makes this triangle commute? The identity, right? This is hopefully you're seeing the, the, the pattern here. Right? If I put the identity on E cross A here, then that does the job. But we saw last time that the product is a functor, right? So this is just equal to the identity on E product of that with the identity on A, okay? And there's a unique thing here that does it, and the identity on E does it, so the identity of E must be the uh, curry of the evaluation map, okay? So this is our identity expansion, For exponentials, remember we had also this for all the other universal constructions we met, namely that if you curry the evaluation map, you just get the identity on the exponential, which is, uh, you know, you can write it like this if you want. Are you with me? Okay. So what else did we do whenever we had a new universal construction? First, we did this like Socrateasing it thing. Then we fight clubbed it, right? So we saw that it was unique up to a unique structure preserving isomorphism. And indeed, that's true here, although I'm not going to go through the proof because it's a little bit longer than the other one, but you can read it in the notes. So the uniqueness lemma says that exponentials are unique uh, up 
to a unique something preserving ISO. Can you guess what that something is going to be? So remember for the products, it was the arrows involved, which turned out to be the span, the legs of the span, which were the projections. So what are the arrows involved here? Well, it's just the evaluation map, right? So it's gonna end up being evaluation. But for lack of time, I'm not going to go through that proof. You can read it in the notes if you like. Okay. So let's see, what's next? Right, so uh, last time I said that categories with finite products, that was terminal objects and binary products, were Cartesian categories, remember that? So we said Cartesian, I'm gonna be strategic here and leave a hole, categories have uh, a terminal object and binary products. Okay, now if we add exponentials, then we get what are called Cartesian closed categories, and they have finite products and exponentials. And these things are usually called uh, CCCs. Okay, because Cartesian closed categories is just too painful to write out again and again. So what's special about Cartesian closed categories? Well, they can talk about their own arrows. And what, that, what I mean by that is if I have any arrow here, then what I can do is I can precompose it with uh, with this isomorphism that was the unit isomorphism of the product that we saw last time, remember? We, I said that products were unital up to isomorphism. So now I have that map, but if I curry that, then I get a map from the terminal object to the exponential, right? See how this is the curry of this composition? Okay, but this is a global element, remember that from last time, of the exponential, and we can call this the name of the arrow f. Name of f. So the point is, for every arrow in the category, there's a global element that names it. Okay, and in particular, for every identity arrow, We can take its name and get a global element of the exponential of an object in itself. Okay, so uh, the exponentials are sometimes called internal homs of the category, and so this is like an in an internal identity. So you may wonder, if we have internal identities, can we have internal composition as well? And the answer is yes. So let's think about how that would work. So what we want, if we want to get, make an internal composition, right, is we want uh, a map from this exponential object producted with this exponential object to this exponential object. See how that's like the internal version of composition? Because if you, if you, uh, well, if you think of this as the hom from A to B, and this is the hom from B to C, the composition gives you something in the hom from A to C. Right? You give me two arrows, one from A to B, one from B to C, and I give you back an arrow from A to C. But here, it, there's, there's, these aren't arrows, right? This is an object, this is an object, the product of them is an object, this is just one object. And so is this. Okay, so what we want to do is somehow find something in here that will be the internal version of the composition. So how can we do that? 
Well, we can fill this gap if we can fill the uncurried version of the same gap, right? Because here, right, because an arrow and its curry are in bijection, because there is a unique curried arrow, you can always uncurry an arrow just as well, right? If you have the curried version of the arrow, you cross it with the identity, you evaluate it, and you get back the uncurried one. So you can go back and forth between the curried and the uncurried arrow, just like you can in functional programming. Okay, so let's see if we can fill the uncurried version of this gap. So here we have this. Sorry. And then we want to get to C. Okay, so do you see how this gap, this hom, is the uncurried version of this one? We just took the A from the domain of the exponential, loosely speaking, and put it uh, in the product of like the domain of the, the hom that we want to fill. Okay, so now we can make some progress. The first thing we need to do is a little bureaucracy, so this part is uninteresting. The goal is basically we want to get this thing next to this thing. So first let's use the symmetry of the product to get them closer together. So this is just an isomorphism, which is the symmetry of the product uh, crossed with, that is the product of that, with the identity on A. Does that make sense? That's just a structural isomorphism. It always exists. Okay, now we want to get this thing close to this thing, so we can use the associativity isomorphism. Oops, that's not what I meant to write. <coughs> so that's again a structural isomorphism, it's just the associativity of the product. See, I just shifted the parentheses. Okay, now we're kind of in business, right? Because what, what arrow related to an exponential do we know always exists that has this domain? The evaluation map, right? So if we do the identity on this producted with the evaluation map, then we get this, right? But now, we're basically home free because we have another evaluation map for B and C. That was the evaluation map with A and B, but we have another evaluation map. I can subscript this, right? Epsilon sub B, and here's epsilon sub C. And so we built an arrow that fills this gap using only arrows that are guaranteed to exist in any Cartesian closed category, right? So in any Cartesian closed category, we can do this. Then we can curry it and get, I'll call it a kappa for composition. I'm not sure that's how kappa looks, but okay. Uh, and so I'm claiming that this is an internal version of the composition. And in fact, it is, although we don't have time to go through this, but it's true that for any arrows f from a to b, and, excuse me, and g from b to c, if we take the name of f and the name of g, remember these are each arrows from the terminal object to their um, homs, like their, their internal homs, their exponentials respectively. So if we tuple this, then we get an arrow from the terminal object to the product of the exponentials. And if we compose that with the internal composition, then that is just the name of the composite. So the internal composition behaves just like the composition, right? These are both arrows from the terminal object to, to the exponential of A and C. Okay, so I won't talk too much more about this, but this is the sense in which in Cartesian closed categories, you can talk about the, the arrows within the same category. Okay. Um, Next, I want to talk about the exponential functor. So I guess I'll leave that. Yeah, I'll erase this. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so if you remember yesterday, once we defined the product of objects, then we asked ourselves, can we come up with a sensible definition of a product of arrows in order to make the product into a functor? Remember, this is kind of the narrative. So we want to do the same thing with exponentials. We have now a notion of exponentials of objects, and we want to ask ourselves, can we do the same thing for arrows? So, uh, well, I'm going to do answer that halfway. So let's fix an object, uh, what do I call it, A, in some category, some Cartesian closed category in particular, okay? Then for any arrow G from B to C, say, it, it's just, I'm just arbitrarily naming this domain and codomain, we can define the exponential of A by G, like this. Okay, well, let's try to build this up uh, like interactively, right? So we don't, I don't know yet what the definition is. It's gonna be something. But I do know what its boundaries ought to be, right? Because if this is a functor, remember functors have to respect boundaries. So what's the domain of G? Well, it's B, right? So then the domain of this thing has to be this, right? And the codomain of this thing, oops, wrong arrow, has to be this. So do you see how by knowing the domain and codomain of the arrow G, I was able to infer the domain and codomain of this uh, arrow. Right? You just put the domain of G in the slot here to get the domain of the uh, functor image, and likewise for the codomain. Okay, so let's draw a picture. We have uh, A, B, and C, like before. So here is uh, the evaluation map for that. What we want is some arrow from uh, this exponential to this exponential, right? This is what we want. This is our desired arrow. But we don't yet know what it is. So we can see if we can find its uncurried version, and then if one, then if we know we can always curry it and get what we want, right? So its uncurried version has codomain C and domain uh, like this, right? I take the A from the domain of the exponential in the codomain and product it with the domain, if that made any sense. Right? Just, I just uncurry it, just like in functional programming. Okay, now I wanna fill this gap. Well, I have around this arrow G, so let's put that in here. Right, that was what was given to me. So now I wanna fill this gap. But I have this structural arrow, the evaluation just like before, right? So how about we define this to be the curry of the exponential B composed if that's the case, then remember if we take its product, with the identity map on A, and compose it with the evaluation map on C, then this triangle commutes. That's the universal property, right? That's what's always true for an exponential. Okay, so stick this in your pocket because in a few minutes we're gonna see that this tells us that the evaluation map is a natural transformation, and furthermore, it's uh, the co-unit of an adjunction. But we're not there yet, so we'll keep that in abeyance. But what we do have is this. So let's put this over here. Okay, and that's our proposed definition of um, the functor. So the action of the exponential on arrows. Right. So we're defining, so 
Let's see. Let's see how to say this. So this lets us define a functor, the exponential of a by blank, uh, right? Uh, so this has domain C and codomain C. So it's an endofunctor on whatever category we're in. Right? If you put an object here, it gives you back the exponential object. If you put an arrow here, it gives you this thing, which we're claiming is how this thing should act on arrows. And I'm claiming furthermore that this definition of, uh, of this thing on arrows makes it into a functor. So the proof of that is in the notes. I, I won't do it at the board. It would take too long, and I'd probably mess it up because it's a little bit tricky. But uh, I'll leave that for now, but th this will come up later, which is the reason that I spent so much time on it. Okay, so. Let's use our exponentials now to give an interpretation to function types. Okay, so if we have a type A and a type B, we can form their function type, which I think Bob and Dan wrote like this, right? And we can choose to interpret that as, well, we recursively interpret A and B, and then we take their exponential. Okay, so the introduction rule for this is the lambda abstraction, which says that in a, uh, in a context, oops, I need some more space. If in a context extended by A, I have a term of type B, then in that context, I have the lambda abstraction of that term of type, a function type, right? That's our intro rule for function types, lambda abstraction. Okay, so we can interpret that as something, right? Namely, it has to be some arrow from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of this function type, which we just said is the exponential. Okay, so what arrow do we have uh, that takes you from uh, the uh, interpretation of something in an extended context, right? Because remember, this was the product. We interpret this as the product to this. Well, that's just the, exp the curry, the exponential transpose of whatever the interpretation of Fm was. See, because the interpretation of this thing is something from the product of the interpretation of gamma and A to the interpretation of B. So if we curry that, then we get something from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of the exponential of A and B. So I cleverly chose the same notation here as we use here, but I mean, that's just notation. This, this is in type theory, this is in category theory. So just like we had two crosses for products, they meant different things. One was the product in categories, one was the product of types. Okay, so let's do the elimination, which says that if we have a term of function type and a term of the argument type, then we can apply the term of function type to the term of argument type and get a term of the result type, right? So that's just the application rule. So if we want to interpret this, we need a map from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of B, given 
maps from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of the exponential and respectively to the interpretation of the domain thing. But how can we do that? Well, if we had that product, uh, we could just compose by the evaluation map. And how do we get that product? Well, we have two maps from the interpretation of gamma to the two factors of the product that we want. So we can just tuple those. to get a map from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of the product. And then, as I just said, we compose that with the evaluation map, and that gives us what we want. OK? So if that didn't make sense, you should draw out these things in diagrams, and you'll see that the types all line up. OK, so that's what I wanted to say yesterday. And now we're like almost halfway through today, so that's a bad sign. But uh, let me change gears. Uh, I guess while I'm erasing, I can pause for questions. Does anyone have a question about what I just said? Yes. Yeah. Well, not every Cartesian closed category is, uh, is it well pointed? Uh, hmm. I don't think that's true, but okay. Let me answer that question later. Let me, both because it's hard to think like, you know, on my feet and also for lack of time, I'll just like now take questions about what I said and then during the break I can take questions about like how this relates to other things. Okay, uh, let me move on because there's some cool stuff I want to tell you about. Okay, so <clears throat> what do I want to say? Um, okay, it turns out that categories of categories have like higher dimensional structure than than your typical category has, right? So a category has objects and arrows, and a category of categories has objects and arrows and something else, and that something else is what I want to talk about next. Okay, so the carrier of this higher dimensional structure is called naturality, and it arises from a structure called a natural transformation. So um, if we have two parallel functors, then uh, a natural transformation between them we'll call it phi from oh not write that yet from f to g is a functor phi from the category C to the arrow category of D such that if I compose phi with the domain functor, I get the first functor, F, and if I compose it with the codomain functor, I get the second functor, namely G. Okay, so remember when I introduced the arrow category and this do domain and codomain functors, I said that this was the beginning of the higher dimensional structure of categories. This is where I cashed that check. Um, so this definition is probably not very uh, evocative for you. So let's, let's write this out explicitly. see what this means. Okay, so 
for an object, okay, so here in the category C, let's say I have an object A, then this means that in the category D, I have an arrow, right, because the objects in the category of arrows of D are the arrows in D, and it's, since it's, if I compose this with the domain, I get F, then the domain of this arrow has to be F of A, and if I compose it with the codomain, I get G, so the codomain of this arrow has to be G of A, and so I get an arrow here, which I'll call phi of A, and this is called the component of the natural transformation at the object A, okay? So every, for every object in the domain category, the natural transformation has a component arrow in the codomain category. Okay, uh, now we have to say what it does on arrows too. So now if I have an arrow between A and B in C called F, right? So this stuff is all going on in C. Then I have to tell you what's going on here. Well, for A, I get its component. I'll just draw it again. And for the object B, I get its component. Now remember what an arrow was in the category of arrows. It was a pair of arrows between the domain and codomain respectively that made the square commute, right? So that means I need an arrow here and an arrow here making this square commute. But I just said that when I compose this thing with the domain, I get F, and when I compose it with the codomain, I get G. And I already know how F and G act on arrows because they're functors. So this is F of F, and this is G of F. Okay? And this square has to commute. And this is called a naturality square. Okay, so this is just breaking down explicitly what that says. Okay, so in order to explain this second dimension of structure to categories of categories, I need to introduce another category yeah, I know this seems never ending. That's the way it goes. So this thing is called the functor category. I have categories C and D. <coughs> the functor category which I'll write like this, fun C, D, between them. So, okay, I'm defining a category. I need to tell you all the stuff, right? What are the objects? What are the arrows? What are the identities? What's the composition? So, has the objects are, so that's fun, zero, that's just defined to be the functors from C to D, unsurprisingly. How about the arrows? Well, So this is the name of the category, and an arrow from an object in this category, which is a functor, call it F, to another object in this category, which is another functor, call it G, is defined to be the natural transformations from F to G 
as just defined above. Okay, so now I need to tell you the identities. So the identity natural transformation on a functor f, well, in order to tell you what that is, it suffices to tell you its components, right? So if I tell you uh, at an object A, now I have to give you an arrow in D from F to F. So what arrow should I give you? Sorry, from F of A to F of A. Right. I should just give you the identity of F of A. And this is an arrow in D. And then the composition says that if I have two natural transformations, phi and psi, say, and I want to compose them, then I can tell you what its component is at an object in category. And unsurprisingly, I just take the components, which are arrows in the codomain category, and I compose them. Okay? So it's kind of just the obvious thing. And then I have to prove that this, is that this composition is associative and unital, but I can see that already because it's just defined in terms of composition in the codomain category D, and composition there is already associative and unital just because D is a category. So therefore, the composition of natural transformations is. Okay, so let's go over here. Okay, so a functor category is a category, right? I just hopefully demonstrated that. In other words, it's an object in, let's say, cat, right? So, well, I mean, it depends where C and D live, but a functor category is a category, so it's an object in some category. So, what do I want to say? Fun. CD in cat, say, somehow represents the functors from C to D in cat, right? And we saw a few moments ago that exponential objects I'll give this another name. Let's wait, that's not what I wanted to say. Sorry. Exponential objects in some category represent the Homs. in that category. So a natural question is, are functor categories the exponentials in categories of categories? Right? And the answer is generally yes. So functor categories are the exponentials in categories of categories. And in particular, that makes cat a Cartesian closed category because it has products. Pro remember, last time we had the category of ordered pairs, which was an exercise to show that that's a product. And it has exponentials as functor categories, so it's Cartesian closed. It also has a terminal object because the singleton category was terminal. OK, so, um, so that's an example of a Cartesian closed category for you. OK. So the next thing I want to tell you about is another way we can make natural transformations.
because now having the second dimension of structure gives us new ways to put things together. So remember the first, at the beginning of the first lecture I said sort of the underlying idea of category theory is that whenever you have some configuration of things that are composable, then there should be a, a unique composite to them. So uh, in categories of categories, we can think of the categories as objects. Why is it so bad? Right? And the functors as arrows. So if I have two parallel functors, then I can have a natural transformation in between them. Call it alpha. And then if I have another functor in the same functor category, and I have a natural transformation here, call it gamma, then I can compose them like this by composing them in the functor category. OK? Does that make sense? These, are, these two natural transformations are in the same HOM, so I can compose them in the functor category. But what if I have this situation? What if I have two natural transformations that are beside one another in this sense? Okay. The question is, can I define a natural transformation from the functor F1 composed G1, because these functors are composable, right? so I can make the functor that's their composite, to F2 composed G2. Can I define some natural transformation of that kind. Okay, and I'll call this alpha double dot for beside beta. Okay, so our goal is to see that yes, we can make a sensible definition of this. Okay, so let me explain how that works. Uh, note to self, for the love of God, write this on the sideboard. Okay, <laughs> sounds urgent. I think it's because I need to come back to this. Okay, so here's the dilemma. We can define uh, there is a natural transformation I'm calling alpha beside beta from F1 composed G1 to F2 composed G2 as depicted in that diagram, right? And now I have to tell you its components. I'm going to define the component of this. This is called a horizontal natural transformation because the two, the horizontal composition of natural transformations because the two things that you're composing are written side by side. It's just jargon. It doesn't really mean anything. But it's component at an object A in the domain of the whole thing, right, which is the category called A over there, is defined to be either G1 of alpha of A composed beta of F2 of A or equivalently, I'm asserting beta of F1 of A composed G2 of alpha of A. Okay, so this is really confusing, right? Like we can't really make much sense of this yet, but let's try to draw some pictures to see what on earth this means and why it's the right thing. Okay, so just to be clear, this is currently an assertion. I'm telling you these things are equal, and furthermore, I'm defining this to be their joint value. OK, so let's see how that can possibly work. OK, so here's the setup, right? We have these categories A, B, and C, and these two 
natural transformations as, to, as shown. So in the category A, does my A look so bad? In the category A, we have, say, an object A, right? That's what we're trying to define the component of. So that means in the category B, we have its component under the natural transformation alpha. Remember, a natural transformation sends objects to arrows, namely their components. So here, we get a map from, well, what does alpha go from? F1 to F2. So this goes from F1 of A to F2 of A. And this is alpha of A, the component of the natural transformation at A. You with me so far? I started with an object here. I used this natural transformation to get its component arrow here. Now what I'm going to do is use the naturality of this to get a naturality square here out of that thing. Right? So let's see how that goes. So remember the naturality squares say, well, the vertical sides of them are just the components of the domain and codomain. So that means I have here um, G1 of F1 of A. Right, because basically I hit this whole arrow with G1 and I write it up here. Yeah, I need more space. Okay. Let me write it here. So I have G1 of F1 of A. G1 of alpha of A. I'm just hitting this entire diagram with G1. G1 of F2 of A. Okay? Now I'm going to do the same thing again, but hit it with F2 down here. So I, not F2, G2. G2 of F1 of A. G2 of F2 of A. And then the arrow becomes G2 of F2 of A. Uh, no, that's not what I meant. G2 of alpha of A. Right? I made two copies of this diagram. One prefixed by G1, the other prefixed by G2. That's all I've done. But now, this is, this is an object in B, so it has a component under beta, which is an arrow in C. Right? And in particular, it goes from the G1 image of it to the G2 image of it. So this is beta of F1 of A. And likewise, I have the component here, right, under beta, which is beta of F2 of A. I just take this thing that's going from G1 to G2, and the beta is the... the thing mediating between them, okay? So this square commutes by the naturality of beta. This arrow exists by the naturality of alpha. And we just started with a simple object in A, okay? But now let's look at this crazy square and compare it with what's written over here. I said G1 of alpha of A followed by beta of F2 of A. G1 of alpha of A followed by beta of F2 of A. Good, so that's this half of the square. And I asserted that that was beta of F1 of A composed G2 of alpha of A. Beta of F1 of A composed G2 of alpha of A. So this square commutes by the naturality of beta, and therefore this assertion is valid. Got it? And so that the diagonal of this naturality square is what we're defining to be the horizontal composition of alpha and beta, its component at the object A. Okay, so what I want to emphasize is that may seem complicated, but what we just did is we followed our nose, right? Like, I had to look at my notes a lot when I wrote this down because I can't recall this out of thin air. But when I started doing this, I didn't have to look at my notes hardly at all because I just do the only thing I can do. I just use the naturality to get a component, and I use the naturality to get a square that I know commutes, and then I hopefully, if I didn't screw up, look at what's on the square and see that it, observe that it's what I wrote over there. Okay, so hopefully you can see that although this seems unmotivated, it comes from something pretty straightforward. Okay, so 
I'm not going to do for you uh, at the board the fact that the naturality squares of this horizontal, horizontally composed natural transformation commute because it's a three-dimensional diagram that's basically two copies of this mediated by four other squares and would take me like a good 20 minutes to draw it. So please read it in the notes if you care, but, but it's true, right? So this turns out to be a natural transformation and these are its components. So I'll pause and see if anyone has questions about that. Okay. So what did I want to tell you next? Okay. So the next thing I want to say is that this is a pain in the ass, <laughs> okay? Like reasoning about natural transformations by their components and their naturality squares sucks, right? Like in one dimension, it's hard. In two dimensions, okay, I don't know if you can see this, but just in case I needed it, I drew, uh, I drew the commuting three-dimensional cube that's the naturality thing, right? And imagine if you have to do, imagine if you have to trans, commute, compose three of these things, or four of these things, or five of these things. Like, I can't draw a five dimensional commuting cube, right? So, this is, a, this is a pain. But luckily, this is like kind of the wrong idea. Or, okay, now I'm speaking subjectively. In my opinion, this is the wrong idea. So, a natural transformation is not what's going on in the co domain category of the parallel functors, right? That's kind of like a shadow of the natural transformation. So if you know about Plato's allegory of the cave, right, there are these people who are like chained in a cave and they're staring at a wall and they see like shadows on the wall and after a while they think that the shadows on the wall are like the real thing. But the real thing is like three-dimensional living in the world and the shadows on the wall are just their projection. And these like components and naturality squares of natural transformations are just the, the shadows on the wall. They're not the real thing. So the real things are like this. They live in like two-dimensional lands between the one-dimensional uh, things, which are the functors. And it turns out that we can define this more systematically. We can define a two-dimensional category, which has, well, uh, as, as objects, things that we'll just call zero cells, points, like, like these, as, as arrows, things that we'll call one cells, like, like functors, right? So categories are in categories of categories, categories are instances of these objects, functors are instances of these arrows, but now we have this new two-dimensional thing, the natural transformations, which are like these surfaces, which mediate between parallel functors, okay? So we could axiomatize this, but it would take too long, and it's, it's beyond the scope of what I wanna say, but what I will say is that, um, that we require for every composable configuration, there to be a unique compo composite. This is sort of one of the mantras I want you to remember. So when we're in a situation like this, and we have here alpha, gamma, beta, delta, and I won't bother to name the arrows, but you can infer, then we want it to be that if I compose alpha with gamma, right, in the functor category, and I horizontally compose that with beta followed by delta in its functor category, then that should be the same thing as taking alpha and horizontally composing it with beta, right, as we just defined, well, yeah, as we just defined, and composing that now in the functor category from A to C with what we get if we horizontally compose uh, gamma with delta, okay? So this equation is called the interchange law. And we need it to hold in a two-dimensional category. But going back to my theme of the unbiased I, like presentation or idea behind a category, right? This is just a consequence of the fact that this is a configuration and it has a unique composite. So you can name it this way. This is like putting, right? This is like putting the vertical Legos together first and then putting the horizontal Legos together. And then this is doing it the other way around, but it doesn't matter. You build the same castle whether, no matter how you put your Legos together. Okay, 
So um, two-dimensional categories that satisfy this law are called, uh, well, in this case, strict two-dimensional globular categories, but we'll just say two categories. And in fact, cat is one such, right? So now, well, I have a little bit of time. Okay, so I want to tell you about adjunctions, but the nicest way to tell you about them <laughs> is to give you a behavioral characterization, which I can only do in a two-dimensional category. So there's a nice, uh, actually, let me, let me reuse this board before I move on. There's a nice alternative way to draw these diagrams, which ends up being very, very useful for a reason I'll explain in a second. So if we take a diagram like this, a, a two dimensional um, uh, diagram in, in categories of categories, or more generally in two-dimensional two categories, and I take what's called its graph dual, or its Poincaré dual, then I get what are called string diagrams. Okay, and I'm, because I have so little time, I'm just gonna go like give you an example, and hopefully you'll be able to infer what's going on. But when you take the graph dual, well, okay, a little bit at least, enough to follow the rest of what I'm about to say. When you take a graph dual, you take each like n-dimensional region and turn it into a k minus n-dimensional region where k is the highest dimension. Okay, let me just give you an example. So here, <laughs> this is a, these, these categories are points, right? They're zero-dimensional. So I'm gonna turn them into two-dimensional regions, okay? These arrows, let's say F1, F2 and F3, and likewise G1, G2, and G3, they're one dimensional, so they become still one dimensional, but perpendicular to their, their dimension that they are here. Okay, let me explain. And, and furthermore, these things which are two dimensional now become zero dimensional. So the zero dimensional things we fatten up to beads. So alpha is a point, but I'll fatten it up to a bead. And its domain is the one dimensional thing F1. So I'll draw that here. And its codomain is the one dimensional thing F2. So I'll draw that here. I'm just labeling the string, that's not a bead, right? Uh, let me make myself more space. And then uh, gamma has domain F2 and codomain F3, okay? So I've just drawn that as this. Here, I have something similar going on. I have beta going from G1 to G2, and delta going from G2 to G3, okay? So you can translate diagrams like this into diagrams like this. The point is that when you compose two, two, two cells, two-dimensional things within the same well, functor category, but there's no functor category anymore because we can just axiomatize this as an abstract two-dimensional category. You compose them vertically in that you connect the output wire of the first bead to the input wire of the second bead. And when you compose things horizontally, you just put them next to each other. Okay, so then over here, this becomes the region A, the region B, the region C, and this becomes the diagram that is equivalent to this one. So I'll let you stare at that for a bit. But I think what I wanted to show was, oh, the reason I wanted to leave this on the sideboard is now, I want to tell you about the essence of naturality. So let's look at these two expressions. I'm saying that alpha next to beta which is like this, and this is going from uh, F1 to F2 and G1 to G2, 
that this was defined to be, okay, what's the first expression? Oh, and I'm having this component at A, but actually the component of A is not really playing any role. We can just accept a diagram like this and have a constant wire at A. Right? So this is like this is like a global element basically. Uh, so this is the category uh, C here, the category D here, and the category, no, I didn't call them C, D, and E, I called them A, B, and C, didn't I? What did I call them? I forgot already. A, B, and C, right? A, B, C. Okay, so this first expression here says that I do alpha followed by G1, and this is like, you can think of this as the identity two cell on G1, or just the wire on G1. So I have here alpha, and here I do nothing. This is G1, this is F1. What's coming out here is F2. Okay, then I do nothing on F2, and beta from G1 to G2. So I do nothing on F2, and beta from G1 to G2. So what's the relationship between these diagrams? This one has the two beads exactly side by side. This one has one bead a little higher than the other, but they're basically the same. And I asserted that this was equal to this other expression, which says, oh, I'll just add in the A for consistency. The A is just going along for the ride, it's not doing anything. Okay, in this one, I do nothing on F1, and I do beta from G1 to G2. So here's F1, I do nothing there. From G1, I do beta to get me to G2. Then I compose that with doing alpha from F1 to F2, and nothing on G2. So I do alpha from F1 to F2, and nothing on G2. So what's the relationship here? Well, I just wiggled the bead along the wire, right? I moved this one down a little, I moved that one up a little. Does it seem plausible to you that these three things should be the same? Okay, so, so I have a niece who has like this toy called a bead roller coaster. And it has some wires and some beads and you just can move the beads along the wires. And if there's two wires that aren't attached to each other, right, then you can just slide the beads up and down past each other all day. As, as much as you want, and it's the same thing, right? It's no problem. So in my subjective opinion, this is the heart of naturality. This is what I call naturality as independence. By which I mean, if two things are independent, if they're not connected by an input-output relationship, right? If the domain of one thing is not connected to the codomain of the other, then you can wiggle them around and it makes no difference, it's fine. And what this is, if you remember the, the, the naturality square we had before, this equation is just saying that that naturality square commutes. But the advantage of this is I can put beads next to each other all day, I can put seven beads next to each other, and I can wiggle them all around to my heart's content, and it's obvious that, that I'm doing nothing basically, right? Now, if I want the seven-dimensional naturality square that I'm trying to prove commutes, it's, it's challenging to think about, right? So this gives you a lot more sort of insight into what's going on. And there's a beautiful theorem by um, Andre Joyal and Ross Street, I believe, which says that anything that's true topologically in this graphical language, well, modulo some, some like caveats, but they're the obvious things, right? Things that, are, things that a kid would agree are true topologically in this, in this graphical language are true algebraically. And this is really useful because then if you're trying to prove something complicated algebraically, you can draw the picture, use your intuition to wiggle it around the right way, then once you figured out the solution, read back out, right? Like just as we translated this to this, you can translate this back to that. Read back out what you've done, check that it's all true. I mean, unless you made a mistake, it will be. And you've proved a theorem basically by playing with a bead roller coaster. And in my opinion, this is a very powerful technique. Okay, so I'm going to go for a few more minutes. Because um, I want to tell you something about adjunctions. Uh, 
Oh, and I wanted to tell you another thing. So this, this idea of using string diagrams as a graphical language to actually prove theorems, it's, there, there's a proof assistant based on this. So there's a guy named Jamie Vickery, and he and his team have developed a proof assistant. It's online, it's called Globular. And basically, this is what you do. You draw string diagrams and you manipulate them around with your mouse, and then you can prove theorems this way. What yes? Globular. Uh, I think the URL is globular.science if you want to look it up and tune out from the rest of my lecture now. Okay, so adjunctions. So there are lots of ways we can define adjunctions. I'm going, well, okay, we'll see how much time we have. I want to tell you about basically three and a half. So two that are like distinct and two others that are duals of one another. So I only count that as one and a half. Uh, and this is sort of, okay, so when we were doing universal constructions, remember how I tried to sort of instill in you that they're all kind of parallel in some way? I tried to write them like, it's a distinguished blah, 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 such that for any probe, blah, 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 there's a unique med mediating map such that blah, blah, blah. Like, you started to think maybe that there's some common structure that all of these things are an instance of. And the answer, or the, the fact is that there is, and that structure is an adjunction. So these are kind of the heart of a lot of things. Okay, so here's one definition. Um, and this, this I'm, you can do this definition in any, in any two-dimensional category, but for consistency with the others, I'll just pretend we're in the category of categories. So for anti-parallel functors, by anti-parallel, I just mean they go in opposite directions. Oops, I didn't want to put that four. Let's start the sentence there. Functors, f and g, form an adjunction which we write like this, f with this backward turnstile, g, if there are two-dimensional morphisms, so i.e. that's natural transformations, eta, which goes from the identity functor on the category C to the composition of F and G, and epsilon, which goes from the composition the other way around, to the identity functor on D. Okay, continued over here. <coughs> Such that the following two laws hold. Okay, first I'll write the equation, then I'll draw the picture. That's the first one. The next one is okay. So what on earth do these mean, and how on earth would you ever remember them? So let's draw the string diagrams. Eta is a natural transformation from the identity functor on C to the composition. So it's like a bead labeled eta. Usually identities are not drawn. We can draw it as sort of like a ghost wire, but we don't really need to because this is C and this is C. So like the identity does nothing. So typically we just leave that off, but you can imagine like a ghost wire there if it makes you happy. So the domain is the ghost wire on C and the codomain is F followed by G. Okay, so that's what eta looks like. It looks like a little cap, right? It has nothing coming in and two things coming out. So this is C around here and D in the middle, right? Because F takes us from C to D, and G takes us from D back to C. And so you can read this by scanning down. First, you do nothing on C, then you do eta, which takes you from doing nothing on C to doing F followed by G, which is what this says, okay? And epsilon is like this, but just upside down. 
So it has f followed by g coming, or sorry, g followed by f coming in, right? And g goes from the category D to the category C. Sorry, these two things are distinct, right? And the identity or the ghost wire or nothing coming out. Okay, so this is what the like Lego blocks for the two natural transformations look like. Okay, so let's try to draw this picture. It says we have eta horizontally composed with the identity on F. So we have F, the wire F that we're doing nothing to next to eta. Then below that, we have the wire F that we're doing nothing to here composed with epsilon. But epsilon takes this G, right? This, this has to be F and this has to be G because that's the shape of eta. <coughs> And epsilon has the G coming in and the F coming in and nothing coming out. So this is just, a z this is called a zigzag, right? What does the right side of this equation say? It says that's doing nothing to F. Okay, so we can put a little box around this, and a little box around this. So what is this equation saying? It's saying if you have a string with a zigzag in it, and you pull the string straight, then you just get a piece of string. Okay, so this is, these things are called the zigzag laws. Uh, and so this one just says the opposite, right? It says that if we have G and eta, which has F here and G there, right? And then we compose that with epsilon, which has a G coming in here and an F coming in there and nothing coming out. So that box, that that is just the identity natural transformation on the functor F, or in other words, the identity on the wire G. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you or maybe I've given, told you it's plausible that like this graphical language really helps because like these equations, not so intuitive. These pictures, very intuitive. Okay, so the terminology here is that um, F is the left adjoint to G. G is the right adjoint to F. Eta is the unit of the adjunction. Epsilon is the co-unit of the adjunction. And these laws are variously called different things. I call them zigzag laws or yanking laws. You can think of it as yanking a string straight. Okay? And this characterization of adjunctions you can do in any two-dimensional category. It doesn't have to be categories, functors, and natural transformations. It can be anything that has <laughs> zero cells, one cells, and two cells. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give you one more characterization. Which is now an internal or a structural one. So if our two-dimensional category happens to be a category of categories, functors, and natural transformations, then we can look inside of it, right? Then we know inside the category we have objects and arrows. So a junction uh, definition two Anti-parallel functors from a category C to a category D and back again. So if I have two anti-parallel functors, F and G, they form an adjunction if there is a natural bijection of Homset. So let me explain this. If, okay, uh, 
natural okay let me explain this so the bijection of Hom says that in the category C for any C object I pick as the domain and any right adjoint functor image of a B object I pick as the codomain for any arrow like this F there is a unique arrow in the other category D that goes from the left adjoint image of the C object I picked to the D object that I picked right so the setup is I pick two objects one in the category C which I've called A here one in the category D, which I've called B here. And then for any arrow in C that goes from my chosen object to the right adjoint functor image of the other chosen object, there is a unique arrow in the other category going from the left adjoint functor image of the chosen C object to the D object that I picked. Got it? So that's the bijection, of, that's the bijection part. The naturality part says that if I have two such, so say I have an A and a G of B and F and a F of A and a B by G. Okay, so this is, these two arrows are in the bijection like this. If I want to extend the bijection, so say I want to extend it down here, uh, by this arrow, right? So here I can extend by any arrow, from B to B prime, an arbitrary arrow. If I want to maintain the bijection, then I have to extend this arrow by the G image of the arrow that I picked. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? If I already have two arrows that are in bijection and I want to extend the bijection by a composition, then in the place where I have a plain arrow, I can pick any arrow I want to extend by, but then I have to extend its, its doppelganger by its right adjoint image. And likewise, if I have here an arbitrary arrow that I want to extend by on the left, then here I have to extend by its left adjoint image. Okay? So, bijection, naturality of bijection. This is, says two things form a pair. This thing says how the pair extends by composition. Okay. So, I guess I'm really out of time, huh? That's a shame. Okay, well, um, let me tell you a couple quick things that I won't write down. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, using adjunctions, we can characterize all of the type forming operations that I've discussed and their duals. So that is the products and coproducts, the unit type, the void type, the function type, Okay, we can interpret those using products and coproducts categorically, um, terminal initial objects, and exponentials. Uh, and furthermore, the, the beta laws and also the eta laws that are equivalences that we may well expect to hold in the type theory for most of the types we do, uh, they arise uniformly out of the adjunction characterizations of these things. So, the, well, okay, I can't really say that, explain why that's true because I didn't get to say those things. But, okay, so read the notes if you care about this. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit more. Uh, and I think I will stop there.